Hello, welcome back to the channel and back to my office. Today, we're going to be talking about how to interpret flow cytometry data. So we'll go over a few basic plots that you'll see when the data is presented and how you would go about interpreting those in order to understand what's happening. So first up is the Humble histogram. As you can see here, it gives you the data for one parameter. Along the x-axis, you'll have whatever marker of interest has being looked at, so in this case, CD45. Along the y-axis is the count. Now, the count relates to the data bins. So even though this looks like a nice, smoothed-out histogram, it's actually a whole bunch of bins with discrete values that have been compressed together to make it look smooth. Um, so you can see up at this top here, there's about 10,000 events in that bin of data. Down here, there's going to be about like 1,800. So it's a, a way of looking at how many cells fall in that level of fluorescence. Now, when we think about these histograms, it's really just looking at the fluorescence expression over a relative scaling. So events down at the left side will have less fluorescence, events moving further right will have more fluorescence. So as the scale numbers increase, you have more fluorescence in that sample. Uh, more commonly, histograms you don't see very often anymore, you will see dot plots. So this is the exact same data moved from a histogram to a dot plot, in this case, just with forward scatter on the axis, just for simplicity to start with. So you interpret this the same way as you do a histogram. Signals with a low intensity on the scale are going to have less fluorescence. As you increase your intensity value, you're going to have more fluorescence. However, the power in using dot plots comes from being able to look at multiple parameters at the same time. So more often than not, you'll probably see it represented more like this with two markers side by side or two markers against each other. Um, and looking at how expression of those markers compare to one another. So in this case with CD45 and our fixable viability die, we use this to find then our alive CD45 cells because these cells will be high for CD45 expression. So they're going to be on this brighter side of the fluorescent scaling and they're going to be negative for our fixable viability die. So we'll have a low level of fluorescence expression in that channel. Um, a few times, because this is just a standard dot plot, you might see your dot plots represented in different ways. The data is the same. It's merely just how it's being looked at. Um, so in this case, here's all the various options you may come across. So you have first just your standard dot plot. And then moving down, we have initially the pseudo color. That's the blue one. And so in this case, the various colors indicate the density of the events. And that is a nice um, addition to a dot plot. Because if you think about our dot plot, we really don't know how many events are packed into that space because everything's just black. In this case, we can see that that area where the red is, is really quite dense. And then it gets less dense as you get more blue. Uh, the zebra plot immediately to the right of that is same sort of idea where um, it's kind of like reading a topographical map, both the zebra plot and the contour plot. Um, so as peaks get closer together, your events are more dense in that area. Um, the density plots you don't see all that often. I'm not a big fan of them. I think they just kind of look like weird ghosty plots, so I generally avoid them. For the most part, I either live in the contour plot world or the pseudo color plot world. The contour plots are really quite nice because they can highlight areas where your gate placement should go. So in this case, you're basically looking for the break between these two circles. This is really clear. It would be pretty obvious where this gate goes no matter what. But sometimes when you have a challenging population, using the contour can make it more clear than the dot plot or the pseudo color does. Anytime you're using a contour plot, always make sure that you show your outliers. Um, otherwise, they're going to be invisible to people and it will make your data look kind of funny and not really represent what's happening. Another important thing to note is that with any of these plots, um, you should always indicate how many events are on there, especially when you start getting into the bottom level plots with the pseudo colors or contour plots. Um, a contour plot can look like it has a lot of information on it when it's just very few cells. 
because it's all relative density to each other. Um, so it can sometimes hide how few cells are on a plot. So it's good to be clear about how many cells you're representing on those plots. If you need more information about that, I would recommend looking at the publishing flow cytometry data uh, video. I'll throw a link in the description. All right, so now that we know the basics of how to read a plot, how do we string them together? And this is going to be looking at a basic gating strategy. So in this case, we're going from one gate to the next to the next, following a hierarchical gating of these samples in order to get to our final populations. So if we look at this example here, we can see up in the top left, they've gated the cells followed by the single cells to get the alive cells. So that's the third plot in. From that alive cell population, they then went on to gate CD3 versus B220, so basic T cells versus B cells. And you can see the three gates here. So B220 positive, CD3 positive, and then CD3 negative, B220 negative. From the CD3s, they went to look on at the classical CD4 versus CD8. And then from this double negative population, they went to look at a number of myeloid expressing markers. So you can see here all the various CD11, B and CD49, B gates, 11, B and C broken down further into the LY6C, LY6G area. Um, so using this to look at all the non-B, non-T cell populations that they were choosing to study. And so by simply following through the gates and then following along the lines of logic, you can figure out how that gating hierarchy was set up. So one other point I'd like to make of histogram versus dot plot is that dot plots sometimes are not your best option, especially when dealing with rare populations. I don't often see this a lot when people are analyzing their cells. Generally, people are going to use the dot plots to their advantage. However, quite often I'll see people sorting with histograms, which always just kind of makes my brain hurt. So if we look at this example here, you can see on the histogram, it looks kind of like there's not really a population there. There's kind of a little shoulder, but maybe not. It's really hard to tell. I see this expression a lot with people bringing in, say, clone cells looking at GFP. And a lot of the times there will be this really faint shoulder that they don't really know where to place the gate. But if you flip that over onto a dot plot, you can see it's really quite obvious where those events are occurring, where the positivity is and where you would set your gates. But also there is a lot more there than you would think there is on the histogram. And that's really the reason why you want to stick with dot plots by and large for most things is because you have the added resolution of being able to see all the events, especially in those faint tails. Um, so when you're doing your analysis or especially if you're sorting, always, always use these dot plots for sorting. But generally, I recommend taking a look at both. Um, I think for the most part, you'll generally be happier with the dot plots anyways. So after that little cytometrist rant, let's talk about high dimensional data analysis plots. So the TISNES and the UMAPs. Um, as people are starting to get into more and more colors in their flow cytometry experiments, you're starting to see these come up more and more often. So these will look something like this, a blobby pattern of random areas that your brain is meant to somehow interpret. Um, so essentially what you're looking at here is a TISNI and a UMAP of the same data. You can see they look very different, but you read them more or less the same way, where any of these little islands represents a discrete type of cell. Um, and cells in that island all have a similar expression pattern that are different from cells in other islands. So if we look at this UMAP more closely, um, you can see I just had it added the multigraph overlays here so I can kind of see which markers are expressed where. So if we look down at this bottom blob coming out, we can see that this is the CD11B area where we also have some LY6C. If we look at the blobby arm coming out to the left, you can see that that's where the B220 is hanging out. Um, and then inside of those, you're going to have other islands based on what else is being co-expressed. 
Uh, but that will give you a nice brief overview of what's happening. Um, hopefully when you're looking at publications, they're going to give you some indication of what cells are existing in what blob and what island. So hopefully that helps you on your flow cytometry data analysis journey. And lost my words for a second. Um, if you have any other questions, please reach out. And other than that, we'll see you in the next one.